Rachel. Right. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, apologies for the delay there in getting started. As you can probably tell, we've got a couple of uh, pretty expected technical um, issues trying to get our links working. So apologies if we sent you the wrong link for this and hope you do, in fact, find us here on our first ever live stream. We, be, we promise to get things smoothed out a bit next week. But uh, anyway, welcome. Just um, before we get started a little bit about this uh, series. Uh, firstly, my name is Matthew Reed. I'm a clockmaker conservator. And uh, for the next few weeks, maybe even the next couple of months, we'll be working our way slowly through a project. And you can see the project here, it's an eight day duration European or English long case clock. Uh, we have a dial, we have a moot, we have a case. So it's pretty much a complete clock. And rather than kind of jumping straight into it, we're going to be taking pretty much, apart from the fact that we're live streaming this, the regular kind of approach I would take. So apologies if it seems a bit frustrating, particularly at the beginning, because today, here's a kind of um, spoiler really, is all going to be about the approach. So we're not actually gonna jump straight in there, taking things off and so on. We're gonna be discussing and beginning the process of the approach to an object. But before we get started, just a little bit about our kind of brand that we've been building up. And that is how to repair pendulum clocks. Uh, we uh, published a book a few months ago, which is uh, squarely aimed at the beginner. And from that book, we started a Facebook group and we heard from our readers that they uh, well, they had a lot of questions uh, that was raised by the book, which was brilliant. And so what we started was something called Open Clock Club, which meets live online every Saturday at six o'clock in the evening GMT. You can get free tickets to that event through Eventbrite. If you go to Eventbrite and search how to repair pendulum clocks, Open Clock Club, you'll find us and join us. The archive of those sessions, and we've done 14 so far, is on another one of our YouTube channels called Open Clock Club uh, Archive. We also have a Facebook group. So uh, again, how to prepare pendulum clocks, you can find us there. And uh, the good thing about the Facebook group is it's not just me kind of going on. Uh, we've got about 100 uh, followers or members or whatever they're called now. And we're super friendly. We're really, again, squarely aimed at repairing clocks. So we don't do buying or selling our valuations or things. Um, we're not a clock collecting group per se, but we're there to help people get through their pendulum clock repairs. If you've been to Open Clock Club, you will, um, you will realize that that's a pretty kind of manic event. We try and get through as much as possible in one hour. And we have a lot of live questions coming in. So we often go off on a bit of a tangent. So I thought it would be nice to do something more at a kind of uh, steadier sort of practice based pace. And so that's what we're going to do. We actually bought three clocks uh, from an internet auction site and they were all 30 hour clocks, but only one had a dial. And in fact, it was through our Facebook group that um, we uh, found the clock that we're going to work on over this next, next few weeks. So you can see it here in the box. 
Now, there's a story behind the box. Uh, we, one day we will do um, a YouTube video about packing, handling and packing for transportation of historic objects. This is not my normal packing regime, um, but there's a story behind the box. So I didn't want to just kind of get rid of it straight away. It's all part of the deal. So yeah, today is about the approach to an object. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a bit about that approach. If I can get the technology to work, I'll share with you a couple of the kind of forms that I use to prompt me. Um, so my work uh, is typically uh, a conservation-based work. I'm a conservator. Um, I'm a professional member of ICON, the Institute of Conservation. So my work's kind of split 50-50 between working for heritage organizations, museums, that kind of thing, and for private clients. And um, I'm going to kind of mix those two things up to try and give you the benefit of my uh, experience in this, in this field. And um, in terms of practice, that's really key, I think, to this uh, conversation, this discussion, this dialogue. And there is live chat there somewhere. Um, I can't actually see the chat, but is the chat up and running? I'm testing it. Right, we're testing the chat, so hopefully there's somebody there. Um, please feel free. I'll try and catch up with the chat when I can, but I won't be doing it sort of live like uh, Open Clock Club. Anyway, so practice, that is a really key word in relation to uh, what I do as a practitioner. And so very basically, without going off on a tangent from the off, very basically, if you think of what you do as a clock repairer, you are or any maker or repairing anything, in fact, um, you have a whole lot of information or experience about tools, typically, about materials, um, about how things work, typical kind of faults that you might come across, uh, and all that. So let's just call that the kind of technical, mechanical side of things, which of course is critically important. And that's really what we talk about in our book. And that's what we talk about at Open Clock Club and in our Facebook group. This is slightly different because when you begin to, um, when you establish those skills, whether you, however far you are on that kind of novice to expert scale or however you want to think about it, there will come a point where this thing called practice develops. Now, you might not call it that. Um, what you might think of is, oh, I don't really want to do that thing. I don't do that kind of work. I don't work for those people or I want to work for those kinds of people. I want my work to look like this. So you begin to build a framework around that kind of mechanical uh, stuff. So that's really critically important for me. I don't know whether there's anybody out there who's interested in becoming uh, a conservator, uh, a professional conservator, or in fact, moving your practice as a clockmaker, repairer, restorer across to conservation. Well, if there is, well, if there isn't, I'm sorry, this session probably isn't for you, as they now say on those YouTube adverts. Um, but if there is anybody there, this could be really useful. When I was in teaching many years ago, uh, students would come to me who would kind of graduated and so on and said, Matthew, how do I get my foot in the door of, say, working for a national institution, a sort of heritage institution? And I would say to them, you know, it's all about the kind of practice. It's about where, where you are with your practice, what you state as what you do, rather than to a degree what you actually do, that sort of mechanical stuff that is, frankly, of maybe not secondary importance, but it's um, it's only half of the deal. Let's let's put it that way. So over these next few weeks, as we look at this clock here, this object, we're going to be kind of mixing those two things up. So I hope it's of use to somebody, and I hope there's somebody there if you've managed to. Uh, get your end of the technology uh, working. So 
let's say, for instance, let's take our scenario that we uh, go to a client or we go into a heritage kind of uh, environment. And normally what we do or what I do, should I say, is that um, the a kind of repair is not the immediate sort of uh, need of these places. Um, there's a big difference. You know, when we get a clock on the bench, there's a kind of urgency to get it done and get it working, get paid for it and get it out the door, get it invoiced. Um, but the kind of world that I work in, to a degree, is a bit different from that. Yeah, we want to be efficient and we want to be good value for money. Um, but the institutions, uh, a lot of the private houses, have really got a kind of different time scale. So let's say I get invited or a conservator gets invited to a property where there are a number of clocks. You want to be able to assess that situation in the most efficient way you can. It's not a case of dragging it out or lots of um, kind of, well, I know it's not a case of dragging it out. It's a case of being efficient still, but in a kind of slightly different way. And this is what I mean when I talk about the approach to objects. I don't mean the physical approach. I mean kind of more the sort of emotional and if you like professional approach. And there are many, many ways of doing this, of course. I'm not saying this is right. There is no proper way to fix a clock and there's certainly no way to approach the clock. But typically what I'm faced with is a, at the beginning, at least a wider picture. And we'll get to talk about stakeholders in a minute. Um, and that wider picture, you, you know, you would need typically to know something about that organization, if it were an organization or about the kind of intent of a collector or maybe a private individual who's inherited two or three clocks, the mechanical fixing the thing is pretty much the kind of end game. Uh, and we're going to do that in these next few weeks. We're going to take this clock apart and we're going to return it to working order. But I want to really emphasize in this session that that is a subsequent stage to the approach to the object. So in that uh, initial approach, what I'd be doing is I'd be thinking about the institution, let's say, for sake of argument, and I would be uh, looking at the environment. And what I mean by that is the kind of, again, the emotional environment, is this a public space, um, the physical environment, humidity, traffic, temperature, light, all those kinds of things. And before I'd even gone near the clock, and this is a top tip for anybody who ever wants to get into conservation of clocks, don't go near the clock. That sounds completely counterintuitive. But if when you're asked to a property, for instance, or a private individual, the relationship, as far as I'm concerned, and again, I totally get it that this is a very subjective approach and, and we'd be delighted to know uh, different kinds of approaches. But my initial interest is not in the clock. Um, if you rush up to the clock and, and often there are some really kind of what, you know, we think of as amazing objects, what tends to happen in my view is that you lose objectivity. You kind of start thinking, oh, there's a problem with the X or the widget's broken or that, whatever it is anyway, all that technical mechanical stuff. That for me comes down the line. What I'm interested in is the relationship with the owner or stakeholder. And so I'd be asking, I'd kind of be stalling for time really a little bit. And this is, we're talking about a 20 minute sort of intro. This is when I'm new to an organization or an individual or something. So this is a 15, 20 minute kind of warm up where my brain is thinking of all sorts of things about how this is going to pan out for me, my business, for the client, for the object, the wider kind of social view. So in that primary uh, moment, I'm thinking of things like, can this be leveraged digitally? Is there an educational output to this? What's the ethos of the owner or the uh, board of trustees or whatever it is? 
So I'm kind of asking a whole range of questions to myself. And typically, you know, you'll meet that owner or you'll meet a curator or a uh, keeper or a, another conservator, um, which, is, which is really great. And they'll have their particular perspective of how they see this thing panning out. And typically it's not a, a short-term relationship. Well, hopefully it's not. Uh, hopefully it's a longer term relationship because um, in the world I'm really privileged to kind of work in, it's the longer term that's typically most important. Now, it's not to say that there is not sometimes kind of emergency or urgent uh, situations that need dealing with. But what I'm talking about here is that kind of emotional approach. And the first time you do it, it's like full on because there's so much to ask and there's so much to take in. Um, and obviously, as you do it more and more, you can speed up that process and you get to know uh, your client before you've even met them. So you can kind of go straight to where they want to be, which takes us back to practice, because, of course, there are some things, you know, you might say I take take on anything. I don't care what the clock is. I don't care what happens to it. Uh, I'm a clock repairer and I can get the clock repaired. If you pay me my hourly rate or whatever it is, I'll go for it. Other people uh, specialize in musical boxes, automaton, turret clocks, um, carriage clocks, whatever. So they may be thinking, well, certain parts of that collection, say for instance of me, other bits are not. Or it might just be um, a no if the, uh, the there's a lot of um, sort of intent from that owner or stakeholder to, um, oh, I've seen some live chat coming up. Great. And we've got at least one viewer. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I've got six viewers. So people are finding us. As I say, apologies for the um, slightly ropey start. We will uh, get better next week. Um, so yeah, the, the approach, and this is where your practice um, begins to kind of kick in, because inevitably, I suppose, in a lot of professions, maybe this is just a wider sort of professional trait, that one tends to start off as a generalist, and for whatever reason, you get funneled and funneled, funneled into more specialist work, and there are lots of things you might say well, I know somebody who would be interested in that. For me, for instance, um, you know, I will take on most pendulum clocks, some automaton, but um, absolutely not turret clocks, for instance, not barometers, not musical boxes. This isn't typical, maybe. I don't really know what other people do, but I do. I know that I don't know enough about those things. I don't feel particularly, particularly confident. Um, to tackle those things. So what I do, if I know somebody who's, say, an accredited conservator in that field, I'll send them that way. And that really works for me. Um, often saying no is really cool. Um, and this is an important point. Again, if anybody out there is watching this and they're thinking, how can I get into conservation as a mechanic, as a clockmaker, as an automaton maker or something, then that kind of distance is a really critical part of getting work uh, and not being straight on the object. And, and it's not that you're not enthusiastic, but there's an approach. And I developed my approach. And if anybody wants to know more about that, I'm really happy to talk about it because there's a big sort of shortage of trusted conservators uh, I don't know what the situation is in the States or in Europe, but certainly in Britain, what tends to happen, and this might uh, uh, upset some people, so I apologize in advance, but um, very proficient practitioners say, and I totally get this, they say, if you want a rest restoration type job, and I don't know what that means, but anyway, I, let's not go there, or you want a conservative approach, I can do both. And of course they can. The problem with that is it puts a whole lot of people off because a lot of the museum and heritage world, it's not that they don't want to move forward, but they've kind of got an idea 
of what they want and um, they just basically want to find somebody, trust them and to a degree lead them to it. So maybe for now that's enough about approach and practice. It kind of sets the scene for what this three months is going to, I said three months, that's how long it's going to take us to get through this, maybe, who knows. Um, that kind of sets the scene for where we're going to be over these uh, next weeks. So those things are always in some kind of tug of war um, in a positive way. And what I find this project we have here, this 18th and 19th century long case clock is relatively contained. Some projects are massive. You need fundraising. Uh, there are dozens of objects more involved, whatever, really big projects. So I find it quite useful to kind of push the whole project away onto the far horizon, as I say, and then bring it really close when you're really looking at all the parts and wear or condition um, or whatever. You can see uh, from the past 20 minutes or so that there's a heck of a lot of thinking to be done. I, I hope there is anyway. It's, the, it's part of horology that kind of interests me really and keeps me engaged with it. However, if you're running a business, you also need to be able to cut through that. Okay, so as I said, I've developed a couple of um, forms and we'll probably just cut off the clock in a minute. I know some of you are probably really, really desperate to uh, for us to get our hands on it. We will get there, not much today, I'm afraid. We're gonna do some photography in a, in a short while. Um, but what I'll do is I'll just cut across to a Word document I've got, which um, if anybody's interested in it, I will put it up on our website, which is how to repair pendulum clocks. And you can have that document um, under a kind of informal Creative Commons license. So if you credit us, if you use it, that would be really appreciated. Um, another thing I'm going to do is later on this evening, depending on how long we run for, uh, I'm going to take some photographs of this clock. Our camera that we've got on the clock at the moment is a, an iPhone type camera. And so the picture isn't brilliant, I'm afraid. We'll be upgrading that in the next few weeks, uh, along with a bit more sort of rigid mount for it as well. But anyway, uh, I'll put those images up on Instagram that I take during the week. So by next Saturday, next Thursday, you can have a look at them and see what you think and kick it about in the live chat. So just a second, are we? Yeah, all good. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so that's it. Yeah. Oh, great, good. So um, yeah, let's just, let's just, this is where, again, glasses on, glasses. So in a few seconds, that should pop up. Oh, no pair of glasses is right, of course. Anyway, I'm about to abandon those. This is just a one page document I put together that hopefully helps with um, the kind of approach to uh, a, a clock. Um, there may be stuff here for you. And as I said, if you credit us uh, wherever you can, remember to tag us in um, on your social media posts and so on. And of course, the world of conservation, like all worlds like that, is a small world. And I'm moderately well connected, I suppose. And I guess uh, as you move around, you'll hear my name. So if you give us the thumbs up for doing this free digital content, that would be really appreciated. So this is about uh, what we're gonna be beginning tonight and we move away from the kind of broader emotional approach. We'll come back to it though, uh, as we um, progress. So this uh, document, is it up? Yeah, can you make it bigger? Can I make it bigger? That's as big as I can make it and still read it. Um, this document, as you can see, developing your condition report and treatment proposal, in the conservation world, it's very unusual to jump straight in and start working on something. And uh, you may, if you're a clock restorer or repairer, you may say, well, it's 
I don't know what you might say, but um, this is critical part of the process. So if you want work in that domain, the conservation heritage domain, you've got to go through a process like this. So hopefully this document, as I said, is helpful. So before you um, actually start working on a clock or an object, you will typically present a proposal sometimes with options. And I'm not going to get um, sort of buried in this. Uh, we're going to run some short courses soon for people who want to actually move their practice to conservation. So we'll really dig into it then. So you typically um, assess the object, you uh, present a proposal, which might include things like what kind of chemicals you're going to use if you're going to carry out any cleaning process, what subcontractors you're going to use. Um, and that is all preceded by the thing we were just talking about, which is the approach. Because if you don't know where you're going with your client or organization or institution, then you may well be going on one direction and they're going on another direction and you never get the work. And you often think, why didn't I get that work? And it's because typically you weren't on the, the right page in the first place. And it might be that you don't wanna be. However, if you do want to be, then this is really important. So very broadly, and this is not one perfect way of doing it, um, an institution, or a conservator, head of conservation, whoever it is who's your contact, will be um, expecting this kind of process. So let's say we've got a dozen clocks in our collection, private, individual, whatever. Often, in my experience, uh, it's not that the people don't know about those things technically, you know, typically, unless they're a collector, they don't. That's not the point, but actually just identifying what thing we're talking about is really important. And that sounds really like crazy. But of course, the clock we've got here that we'll look at in a short while is um, in bits. And they often are when you uh, approach them. So in this case, we've got a case with a hood, a pendulum rod, a pendulum bob, two driving weights, um, and a movement and a dial. Uh, so we've got some things and there are some things that are missing. So right from the get go, that's the priority. And that's what we're going to be doing uh, in a short while. We're going to be actually looking at what we have and what we don't have really critically. Um, so often I work with people or for people and there are horror stories about, oh, um, that person I don't know, lost the weight. So did I have the winding key? Did you have the case key? It's dead easy, never for that to happen. And that's just to make it really, really clear from the outset. So that's point one, is to identify the object. And that's to make it different. You know, some organizations have got thousands, I'm mean, literally thousands and thousands of things. Um, you know, a museum might have 150 objects in its clock and watch collection. So you need some way of identifying that thing from everything else they've got. And typically an institution will have um, an inventory system. And this is a brilliant question. Top tip number two. Um, this is a brilliant question to ask people. Do you have an inventory system? Because it tells them that you're on the right page. Um, that might be a number. It could be an accession code. There's loads of different ways of doing it. Again, non-wrong or right. All you need to know is what unique number is allocated to this object. And then you can give part numbers there. For instance, you might call the case the main bit and then the movement, the second bit, and then the pendulum third bit. However, there's lots of different ways of doing it. And we will dig into that a bit later on. Because what typically happens um there's a thing oh, a word document you see it yeah uh, what typically happens is that you might um, send your report in with a proposal with options and then you don't hear anything for a while institutions can be uh sometimes a bit long-winded some are better than others um but inevitably you typically won't get that yes do it straight away sort of thing that you will with the private client so um, 
a, a few weeks will go by, maybe your proposal will go off to a board of trustees, other stakeholders. So they, as total non-clockies, need to be able to go, right, we know which thing this person is talking about, because you might have, I don't know, 10 long case clocks are all quite similar. And I've just listed some stuff here. This is by no means um, exhaustive. It's just some stuff. So the point of this uh, report that we're going to write, and I'll write one again for this object, not live maybe, but I'll do it during the week and then we can look at it next week if anybody is interested, is where the thing is. Um, sometimes uh, in a big building um, or even an institution, there might be several buildings across several sites there might be a store there might be like uh well think i won't mention one but think of a national museum um they might have outposts uh and in that main building they might have hundreds if not thousands of different locations so we've got our unique identifier we also want to know where the thing is and what is frankly bad in my view um, but sometimes unavoidable is an object might be spread over multiple locations. Now, this is where your um, registrar uh, would come in, because if you're in a big organisation, they'll typically be a registrar. And that's great because they're usually super organised and they can say, oh, yeah, the weights and the pendulum are across there and the whatever. So get that information and put it in the report. Um, so that's kind of wider stuff. And remember, all the time we we're thinking about this, we're thinking about environment, we're thinking about end users, we're thinking about what we're going to do with this thing, because all that is going to feed into our ultimate treatment proposal. Um, completeness of the object is received, right? It's just really one um, important point. Well, actually, sorry, there's never just one point. It's a couple of points here you must cover yourself as a practitioner. I'm self-employed. Um, whether you work for institution or whether you're self-employed, you must make sure that your audit trail is reasonably sound or sound. Um, because as I said before, you uh, eventually get the green light to work on an object and the winding key or the case key or something is missing and it needs to have been listed at a very very early stage either you have it or you don't have it so there's never any kind of uncertainty about that because that kind of thing at, at the least can be a real pain but at the worst it can actually sort of ruin a relationship so um this is where our point number or of object listing at the inventory comes in and when we get to look at our clock we'll run through a kind of made up uh, scenario to uh, demonstrate that okay so the things uh, that you have then this big um, question of the condition of the object is received and again the even these live streams where we're going at a, quite a steady old pace are not the place to uh, to deal with this in depth. If this interests you and you're thinking about getting into um, clock conservation or any kind of object conservation as a professional, as I said, you want to move your practice from restoration and repair to conservation, who knows? Then there are some brilliant programs of study. There are degree level programs of study where you can learn all this stuff. I learned, I learned at West Dean College in Chich near Chichester in West Sussex, which was absolutely brilliant. They, I don't have any particular affiliation with them now. There are loads of um, conservation programs at degree and other levels. And that's where you can really drill into this stuff like condition, because condition is a lifetime's work in its own right. Um, but uh, so what I've done at the bottom of this page, uh, at the bottom of our next sheet when we get there, is really try to kind of grind that down because in the a real world, you know, you kind of have to decide we're in one place and we want to move to another place. And that whole path is something that we're going to agree 
uh, what to avoid there very quickly. Just avoid anything that's like good condition, bad condition, it's ugly, it's whatever. Those words are like meaningless, so don't use them. There's no point. Try and be as objective as possible. And if you go to the National Trust Manual of Housekeeping, for instance, as a publication, I think that's out of print now, but you can buy it on the internet. There's a whole load of words there, like any specialist kind of practice, that you can use to describe condition of things. So um, all these things are quite big. I kind of hadn't realized until today, uh, but they build up over the years. Um, the aim of any proposed treatment well, this is um, a big one, and we could go off on a complete tangent, uh, but very briefly, there is no um, aim per se of this particular project that we're working on, but when you've got a client or an institution or a board of trustees or a curator, presumably they invited you to engage with this collection or this object because they want to do something with it. But in the kind of conservation world, don't make the mistake of thinking they want that object. If it's a clock, return to some kind of uh, conjectured form of state working or whatever. Those things from the off are really, you know, um, they're, they're, they're not part of the deal. It might be. And very, very, very typically, that is the case. Uh, but you could be asked to just to do condition survey. Uh, the object might be going in long-term storage. It might be going for deaccession. Uh, the um, museum might be wanting to acquire it. A whole range of things that are not getting it going again. If indeed it stopped, it might just be annual maintenance, uh, which includes a lot of uh, looking and reporting on condition of lubricants and cleanliness and that kind of thing. It might be for an education program they might be asking you how many cogs it's got in it. Who knows? A, a whole range of stuff. And this is what's really great about being a conservator. There's a, um, a nice idea that you sit at your bench all day looking through a microscope at something, which, of course, conservators do. Uh, but there's a range of other things that you can get into, which is really interesting. So there's your question. Do not presume that it's to return the object working order. Now, in this case, that is what we're going to do because that's typically why people are here. And it's certainly why people are on our Open Clock Club and bought our book. That's to fix clocks, basically, which is totally fine, totally cool with that. But it's not the only uh, thing. So the aim of the treatment, let's say, for sake of argument in this case, this object, um, we don't know the history of it. In fact, this object, we do know a bit of the history. So let's just take it from uh, there. This clock uh, came to us this week. It came through our Facebook page. It was offered, it was free. So thank you, um, the people who donated it to us, really appreciated it, really appreciated, sorry. It's been in their house for 30 years uh, in like this kind of, in bits but not in bits been looked after but not working and before that it was in a pub and it was there we don't know for how long um so it was in a pub in an upstairs room we believe it went to this person's house they didn't ever get around to getting it done up and um it's been donated to us so that's a nice little bit of history and really important to find out and if you're a conservator find out if you can what the kind of service history is because you know that you're going to do a really cool job and you're going to provide the owner or whatever with a nice report and a proposal and that kind of stuff so it's the cool question say could you let me have copies of the reports from previous uh, practitioners or conservators or whatever gives you some idea of what's been done and um I had a really a, a case recently where the previous practitioner had replaced a lot of springs in clocks. And I'm thinking, mm, why, would, why was that? Could that be undone? Could the old springs be put back? And those kind of questions. So you learn a lot from asking uh, that question. And then you move on to actually structuring your proposal. So the proposal, we put treatment with options. Now here, we'll write it down um, in the next couple of weeks. 
But here, as I said, just for sake of whatever, we are going to say we're going to get this clock to uh, work. And, and that's it. We want it to be stable. There's two things there with the object, and we'll see uh, a little bit later on, um, is is it going to kind of damage itself? So is it, uh, how stable is it basically? If we were to put the clock in a store, basically, is it going to be okay for 10, 20, 30 years without much change? Or does it actually need some kind of intervention as a static object anyway? For instance, is there any kind of pest infestation? Is there any active corrosion? Is there something that's going to break and cause more damage? So that's one thing. The second thing is, the second element is, is it going to damage anybody? So this is damage to property and personal damage. So if the clock was to be wound, would the weight line break and break somebody's foot or go through the floor? Or is the clock not fixed to the wall? In this case, it's been a long case clock. All sorts of things. So you're thinking about the risk. Conservation is about risk management, like many things are. And it's a cost benefit exercise, um, which we will come on to as we progress with this project. Um, so we're thinking about uh, we're thinking about those things in the first instance, and then we say, right, so we want to make it safe for itself. That's often cleaning, surface cleaning, consolidation, labeling, packing for storage, packing for transport transportation, gluing down bits of loose veneer, as I said, putting tiny broken or missing uh, detached pieces in bags or labeling them or whatever. And then is it safe for people? So if it's an environment where there are public there and it's a barometer, for instance, or I don't do barometers, um, you know, is there mercury there? Is that going to fall on the floor and there's going to be a mercury spill? Is the clock going to fall over? So they're our first kind of instincts that we would look to um, sort of redress or approach or suggest an approach. And then we begin to think, well, what do we need to do to get this thing back in working order? Because that's what we've agreed. OK, this isn't, um, in my case, what's going on in my mind. This is actually agreed in writing. And this is really important because you can get a long way down the line and you can invest a lot of your own time. Uh, you might travel out to do an inspection of an object or something. And you didn't agree at the beginning what the kind of overall intent was. And you and the owner, or you and the client, or you and the, uh, the sort of trustees, or whoever they are, going in totally different directions. So you've wasted your time and you probably wasted their time too. So what do we need to do in this case to get the thing uh, running again well we've got some uh, stuff like um, the pendulum it, rod is broken so we would want to look at repairing that for instance or replacing it or options um, it needs cleaning it's uh, quite rusty in places and it's quite a lot of surface dust sort of spiders webs and old oil and so on so there's a kind of basic idea that we'd want to wash the clock to get rid of some of that stuff um, then uh, the clock has no hands, so we would propose to make a new pair of hands, for instance, or if, you know, would you maybe try and find a pair of um, kind of broadly period hands? I, I don't know. Many, many options. It's always great, within reason, of course, to explore reasonable options with these things, because it's surprising how a project can go. And, um, and that can be a really, really cool thing. We've done some pretty uh, sort of groundbreaking projects in the past where I've kind of just thought, they're not gonna go for this, but have you considered dot, dot, dot? And the answer is that um, I've been surprised and um, we've had some really great and exciting projects. So we will list the, our options, what we, uh, anticipate doing and of course with a lot of historic objects um we uh find discover things as we go along you know we can kind of guess because we've got experience what the kind of typical things might be but you know there's often chance uh that something crops up so it's really important that you communicate that as and when it uh it pops up so the cost 
No, when I'm doing an estimate, it's a typical kind of hourly rate thing. I have a kind of guide price for clocks that I know, but otherwise it's a, a sort of hourly cost thing. Uh, break that down, I break it down into the hourly rate, into expenses, travel, transportation, all those things. So your owner um, can see where those costs are, insurance, all that uh, kind of stuff. Um, and then that proposal goes off you either get the no um we, we, you don't get the work or yes you do get the work or typically what happens is there are one or two questions what do you mean by this what will that involve is it likely to you know run out of control money wise um what's the time line looking like this could you do any lots of there's usually two or three questions um which is part of the deal and that's absolutely fine and then in importantly our document that we're going to generate to surround this project um, writes that down this is an agreed process that we're going to go forward and if it changes we'll go along we'll let you know part of our report we're going to do we'll have the actual treatment carried out because that can often differ slightly from what you propose and what you actually have to do and then things like aftercare recommendations like how often do we need to get it oiled, get it cleaned, da, 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 all those kind of things. And then there'll be the actual number of hours, in my case, you spent doing it and your invoice. So um, quite a lot to take in there. and But hopefully that gives you a little bit of the background of the process that I would go through when I was repairing an object like this. It's um, quite know what the time it is, but... Uh, Right, okay, so that's taken us um, three quarters of an hour or so to plow through with that. Um, we're not going to go back to this uh, unless people uh, specifically want us to look at a particular point. As I said, um, we're going to eventually run some short courses on stuff like this, and there are some really brilliant conservation programs at degree and other levels that you can enroll on, and I would strongly recommend you do that if that's where you're at. So down here, and I say we'll put this document up on the um, up on our website uh, within the next week. All being well, so uh, yeah, we've we've covered most of this. Propose a path to an agreed status, um, whatever that is. Uh, identify the object. Identify the condition of the object. The treatment. Get written authority. Get written authority. Uh, that is like top tip number three and probably the most important thing is get it written down and agreed because believe me, it can go terribly wrong if it's verbally agreed what you're going to do. Okay, so we've covered most of that. That's, that's it. That's my broadly conservative approach to generating uh, a document. As I said, I'll start to sketch something out and then we'll have a look at it next week and see how that's um see how that's progressing okay so we've done the kind of background albeit rather rapidly now we're going to go on site if you like i'll just show you another document um we'll just stop that share and we will start another one so this is um an Excel spreadsheet. Somehow we can make it bigger. Bigger even. Right, things are just a bit sort of delayed here with the live stream. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. As I said, we'll put these forms on the website so you can um, download them and, as I said, uh, use them as you will, and we would appreciate uh, a credit there. So let's say we've been invited to a collection. Uh, it can be one clock, it can be three, it can be 300, it doesn't matter. What I found in the past is that you make all the effort of going to see an object and you get driving home and you think, I didn't even... Uh, 
do this, I'll do that. I'll did it have a so and so? I was that with it. It's really difficult, especially once you start looking at three or four clocks in a in a session. So I just threw this um, this form together as a sort of aid memoir, a bit of a prompt, and we'll just run through it really, really quickly. We won't fill it in uh, now, but it'll just give you some idea of um, something that can be incredibly useful. So the top stuff is quite obvious. Uh, the date uh, that's the date at which you inspected the um, object. It reminds me of something actually, uh, and we'll have a break at. Uh, 55 and we'll break until seven o'clock uh, GMT. If that's okay, we'll come back because I'm sure everybody could do with a cup of tea or something. Um, so uh, the date when you expected it, but that reminds me of something that for me, I'm not an historian and uh, I'm not um, you know, particularly interested in the history of clocks per se. And so what I try to make clear is that when you're doing this report writing and this preliminary stage, which gets you the work, which is what we're after, is not to mix up any kind of historic research or something, unless you're an historian and unless the client asked for it, because you're doing stuff that you're not being paid for, you're doing stuff they haven't asked for, it might be seen as a distraction. So stick to what you've been asked to do. Uh, when I taught, uh, students would write reports and there's such a temptation to kind of put a little potted history of the object in there. Some people like it. Personally, it turns me completely off. So uh, just a thought. So the date of the inspection, the person that inspected it, they, a lot of these people don't know you. If it's an organisation, um, they can look you up or whatever. The owner's reference. So this would be uh, a a number, um, it could be an inventory number, but I put inventory number down separate because for instance, if this is a museum and you're in a gallery, there can often be a gallery reference and then an inventory number and there are different things, uh, a contact, you know, who is the person who you send this form to directly, typically a, cu a curator, but it might be a conservator or it might be an owner as a private individual. Inventory number, we already talked about that a little bit. Most in institutions have an inventory uh, number, location, we talked about that. Very broadly, object type. Um, in this case, we're gonna put a clock there. Subcategory, long case, uh, description. So this, we know you haven't seen it yet, So, but I'll just type it in anyway. So it's um, early 19th century. Uh, long case clock. Um, well, let's just leave it at that for the time being. Now, um, object on my soapbox, object signature and object maker are often totally different things. This clock, when we get to look at it, is a factory made early 19th century uh, English or European long case clock. And there was no maker per se, you know, it was made in a factory. There were hundreds, if not thousands of people involved. And yes, that factory would have been named, but that name doesn't in this case appear in the clock. I don't think it does anyway. So just differentiating between object um, maker and object signature. And we know what our object signature is. It's John um, Fryer. And let's just put, so this is John Fryer of Pocklington. This person had nothing to do with making this clock, uh, but he had his name uh, on the dial. Object name maker, we don't know. Serial number, I don't think it has one, but if there is one, we'll, when we get it apart. Year of manufacture, circa 18, let's put 1815, um, but it is only that, I'm not an historian. Um, origin, um, English, overall dimensions. Right, this form is a bit of a blunt instrument, I'm afraid, but hopefully it gets you started um, because we collected this clock in bits. So when I talk about overall dimensions, what the heck am I talking about? So what I would do here is put some other rows in this form, this spreadsheet and put case, hood, and all, all the parts there and list them individually uh, so we can begin to 
sort of identify um, what that is. Uh, again, identify any individual parts. We're not writing an inventory record here. What we're doing is making sure that we can say that is the pendulum bob for this clock. Uh, case material, um, I think it's mahogany vanier. Question mark. I'm not a wood uh, expert. You might know a furniture conservator. I strongly recommend that if you're in horology, you find one. And that brings me on to yet another distraction. But I think we said, oh, we've got three minutes to go. I know we said we'd stop at uh, 55, didn't we, actually? OK, well, it's 57 and I've gone on too long. Let's take a little break there and we'll come back uh, at seven o'clock. Um, or thereabouts, and we'll continue. Okay. I think most people caught up on us eventually. It's my fault. Welcome back. A um, bit of a short tea break, I'm afraid. We'll just do a little sound check at this end. We just put the sound on. Thank you, Rich. So um, we'll continue with our form in a minute. Uh, thank you all for uh, contributing to the live chat, as always. Um, all sorts of things there. Um, Welcome back. Um, a bit of a short... 
Uh, we've got a Mercury story, I see, which would be great to hear. And um, yeah, we've got, um, I haven't got, well, <laughs> I have got a good re kind of patriation story of objects. Uh, I've got two, um, but they're offline ones, I'm afraid. But uh, anyway, I'm sure we've all got those really exciting. And um, we've got a musical uh, accompaniment as well. Somebody practicing violin. Uh, regrettably, we bought a violin that's only got one tune. But um, anyway, so uh, thank you for the live chat. That's absolutely brilliant uh, to see you all. So the next part of this form is pretty straightforward. We've, I won't fill it in uh, now. We've got dial shape, dial material, calendar work, wind work, rise and fall, and so on. They're just prompts for me just to get uh, an idea of what we have there. In this case, uh, we can put missing. And that brings me to this idea of losses and missing parts, because a really important um, distinction for instance, when we come to look at our painted dial, uh, it's got some chips and bits of paint missing, or it's got the case has got some veneer missing. They're kind of broadly what conservators sometimes call lacunas or losses. Those things are not going to be reinstated ever. You might fill them in or something or retouch, but the actual paint or veneer that was there has gone and it's on all likelihood is never going to be uh, redone. So that's a loss as opposed to a missing part. As I said earlier, you might have a pendulum and interesting with the mercury uh, story and mercury pendulums, I've worked in institutions where mercury pendulums uh, another time uh, end of a lifetime, maybe, in fact, to talk about all that stuff, but uh, are in a different store or in a different place, or the mercury's been poured out for safe storage or something. But they're not missing things. You know where those things are. So it's just that distinction. Um, if you're writing a report, you don't start saying, oh, there are, um, there's a chip on the dial, an enamel dial's got a chip on it. Uh, that's very different from the winding key, which is in a key safe or something just that distinction. So again, a bit of basic stuff about pendulum, case key, winding key, and other associated parts. So this is really uh, critical that you get this detail because you can then kind of relax about it. Either you have it or you don't have it and you don't care um, what happens to it if you don't have it. Uh, other associated parts, make friends with other conservators. I know clocks people as a broad generalization and it's maybe uh, unfair I don't know they tend to be kind of super practical people and they can do all sorts and some people repair watches and repair clocks uh, which is great I don't um, and some people also work on clock cases which I will do bits of things like gluing down a lifting veneer maybe or surface cleaning or something but um, there's an expectation if you work in an institution or in conservation that you broadly stick to your discipline. But the point is, it's really useful to know other conservators or other practitioners. Paper, we've had a lot of people on our Facebook group with labels inside clocks, which is really interesting. So what do you do with that? Textiles, uh, glass and ceramics, of course, wood, of course. Uh, are there any others I can uh, think of? Um, our plastics, you know, modern materials like that, um, and so on, and chemists as well. So it's really great. And again, uh, as I said, I don't have any particular affiliation to any training institution, but that's a great thing about going on a conservation training program um, is that you get to meet all these other people. In fact, that's actually probably one of the most valuable parts of a program like that is that you get this interdisciplinary action and you get to learn a lot about other disciplines and the languages and the materials that they use uh, and so on. So again, I've just listed a whole lot of prompts here. You can see what they are. We'll fill some of these in uh, here. So no case key. Uh, no 
other associated parts, movement duration, days, frame number. So it's rectangular. We will see the thing in a minute. Rectangular um, number of pillars, four, number of trains, two. Um, now, this form is really for me, it's, it would go as an appendix to a report, but there's no point in really putting trains eight day to uh, the kinds of people typically who see these reports, um, because that slightly sort of technical uh, information isn't of much use to them. Um, but this is just this is just for me really motive power weight or spring. I'm going to be lazy and put W um, weight number of material so uh, two. And I'm mixing up my numbers and letters. I'm afraid. Sorry, um, cast iron, cast iron hyphenated um, material mass. We'll get back to that and weigh them. Uh, mass of weights is really important in, in weight-driven clocks, that these kind of uh, 17th, 18th, 19th century weight-driven clocks, often, but not always, uh, the weights have gotten mixed up. So it's a kind of conservative, again, one of those questions that's whizzing around in the back of your mind is, is this clock overdriven? Does it have its original or earlier weights? And is it overdriven? Because if it is, then maybe there are some options for uh, providing new weights that are, you know, if it's significantly overdriven, that will preserve the opinions and things like that. So, uh, you know, if I'm weighing the weights and they're massive, as they often are or being added to, then um, that's something that can go on our report. Uh, rack or strike, um, count wheel striking. Um, it was really great to see one of our Facebook uh, um, attendees or contributors today who's got an eight day clock, not unlike this one, but the rack is missing. So that's brilliant. That's a lovely bit of geometry and a nice bit of filing as well. Um, bell, but I don't, it doesn't have a bell. That's, no, don't think it has a bell. Um, Escapement and recall. Oh, maintaining power. No, hold fast. No, and so on. So that's just so if I'm doing a survey of a collection, I don't, as I said before, I don't get driving home down the motorway and think. Did that clock have two trains or three trains? Or did okay, um, two trains or three trains? Right. Okay. So we've gathered some basic kind of technical information. Um, as I said already a couple of times, take this form and do what you will with it. It would be interesting to see if you come up with some improvements or uh, if you're a Excel guru, then you might be able to do something a bit fancier. So this is kind of our next step before we'll actually start doing some photography. So um, again, that scenario where you're asked to approach a collection, whether it be a private collection or an institutional collection, often um, the situation is that the owner or the uh, trustees don't have an idea of where the priority is. I had this um, exact example only in the last couple of months. I was invited to a collection. They've got, let's just say, a dozen clocks for sake of argument. Um, and the curator, who's brilliant, doing a great job, but obviously doesn't have masses of technical um, knowledge about all these subject specialist things, wanted me to say, We've got a limited budget. Where should we spend the budget? You know, where what is the priority? Can everything wait? Is there something that's going to, as we said a few minutes ago, is there something that's deteriorating so rapidly or dangerous or a risk that we need to spend some money now to get that thing stabilised? And all this part of this form thing is just to help me and uh, any owner or so on to kind of get a priority for where we go. And 
Um, so as you can see here, we've got um, just a simple thing that will produce a capital letter A to E, it'll produce a number, then it'll produce a letter or Roman one to five. And that can kind of go into a bit of a Venn diagram or a little table that says this thing out of this collection from a conservation perspective is the most in, um, important in terms of immediate uh, deterioration. And as I said, this is often to do with environment rather than uh, it working or not, um, because all you typically do is stop the clock from working. If the oil, again, on the Facebook, um, apologies for those of you that aren't on the Facebook, please come along and join us. We'd love to see you there. But just before we went live today, uh, somebody posted a picture of um, uh, long case clock center wheel back pivot, which had deteriorated due to breakdown or deterioration of lubrication. So if you see that, you know, you can just say stop the clock, it's fine. It can wait there until we're ready to carry out some treatment. It's not going to be deteriorating even more, but that would be, it requires immediate attention because the answer is dead simple. However, you've got um, and as I said, don't do turret, you've got a turret clock with a great big weight there and the weight line is fraying. That too needs immediate attention, but um, on a kind of slightly different uh, level, one thing you'll come across is things like mold, insect infestation. Uh, there are some uh, conservators who only deal with insect in infestation and it's, a, it's an interesting field. And if you see that stuff, you're not expected as a clocks person to be a specialist, but keep your eyes out for it. Again, this is why not rushing straight up to the movement and kind of pressing your nose against the glass is really good. Otherwise you miss this stuff, you lose um, objectivity. So you can see there I've put requires immediate at attention, no attention through to no attention required. Um, this is whether it's a static object or a dynamic object. I'm not particularly fussed which of those two things clocks are. Um, uh, so I've just listed it there. So we've got um, that idea about sort of condition. Now condition, I imagine, okay, <laughs> this is gonna be quite tricky really, but um, there's a clock, there's an object that's been completely refinished. It's been scrubbed with wet and dry paper or a painting that all the paint, paint fell off and it's been totally repainted. It's been got a new frame, it's got a new stretcher, it's got a new supporting canvas. The clock's been polished, it's been repainted, the veneer's been stuck down. Somebody might say that that's in bad condition or poor condition. Another person might say it's in brilliant condition. So really what we're talking about here is stability of the object. We're not making any kind of moral judgment about whether it's in good condition or not. We're interested in stability. So I've just listed five states of broad cleanliness and that are basically, is the thing a relic? Um, is like, I think this clock is going to be number two here, heavy dust, dirt, corrosion products, and other significant dust, like dust, are recently cleaned clean. Now, in uh, horology, for anybody who's following this, who isn't a clocks person, the killer thing with clocks is the state of the lubrication. That's if they're working objects. So in a typical clock like this, a long case clock, um, let's say the clock like this one is in fact, here, it's near the top of the stairs in a building. There's a lot of convection currents in, uh, in that uh, building. So the oil is going to get contaminated with uh, dust, and it's particularly the mineral dust, things like mica, that is problematic to oil because it forms a kind of grinding paste. So, we're put, so there's one thing looking at, say, a big layer of dust on the seat board of the clock, which frankly, who cares really? There's another thing looking at oil on working parts. And again, for those of you who haven't bought our book yet, yet he says, uh, we have a chapter on cleaning. And at the beginning of that chapter, we make it absolutely clear to try and differentiate between working and non-working services, because non-working services like the chassis of a car 
kind of don't matter in terms of cleanliness. They matter in terms of structure, of course, like the chassis of a car. But what we're actually interested in here is bearings. So try and separate those two things out in your mind. So then this last um, category is really a summary of those first two. So, you know, is the clock, in your view, a relic? As in, is it just like past it? And the best thing to do is to put it in an environment where the rate of deterioration will be slowed down. For clocks, that's typically low um, RH, relative humidity, um, which is problematic because clocks are multi uh, material objects often so you got wood as we said before ceramic glass and so on and so forth so not one size fits all now i'm slightly out of touch with the kind of mainstream conservation world but in my day several decades ago it used to be kind of 55 percent relative humidity was a kind of a sweet spot that was least bad for most things i don't know whether that's the case still or not maybe somebody in the live chat who is in con I've got any conservation people there today ask we'll ask we're going to ask in the live chat does anybody know what the thinking is what's really important is stable environment rather than um, a particular kind of environment which of course in any historic building is difficult to maintain. So you can see here, and we'll go back to this form, that you can kind of come up with some kind of um, ready reckoner for broad ideas about um, uh, the where people need to spend the money, if at all. And, you know, I take a reasonably long-term view of this. I don't particularly... I'm in a position where I don't have to particularly care to be able to say we really need to get that thing up and running and working and do this. There is no proper way, in my view, and there certainly is no urgency because there's loads and loads and loads and loads of work, um, particularly keeping our Open Clock Club brand going. Anyway, we'll come back to that form and let's move uh, on eventually to our actual clock. There we are. So, as I said, um, our camera here is not uh, amazing, but it's enough to be getting on with. So, we're going to give this clock an imaginary inventory number. So, we go through uh, the process. And um, I haven't actually thought what that's going to be yet. But what I want to do first is to fill that form out just to kind of record what we've got, where we are. And then from that, we can begin to make a list of things that we may or may not want to do. I've already told you this clock doesn't have hands. So um, um, I think <laughs> insect infestation. Yeah. Mm. Um, the, the clock doesn't have hands, so what are we going to do about that? Are we going to make some new ones? Are we going to try and find some or whatever? Um, and the other thing, I've said it right at the beginning, but just to reiterate, this is not my normal packing regime. We'll talk about that in another life. Um, but what is important here, and it's all going to get a bit wobbly, I'm afraid, on the camera, is that the box has got a bit of information there, which I'm keen to preserve with the with the clock. So little bits of we've said seen on Facebook, tiny bits of labels um, uh, are really important. Uh, going off on a story for, for a second, I once had a ship's bulkhead clock, and on the back it had a little repair label. It was on those tiny little pressure tape cheap labels that you get on a roll, kind of like 10 millimetres by 15 millimetres. And in the faintest biro, it said in it, Corley Fisheries. And from that, I was able to find out where the clock was. I found out which uh, trawler it was on and all that kind of stuff. So that's relatively ephemeral um, information. Ephemeral information is really important. So um, I can't put it off any longer. <laughs> Let's uh, look at our clock. So we've got a um, seat board there. You can see the first thing is that actually the lines, um, the gut lines, I'll get the on. 
these things here are all kind of entangled and so on. Now we've decided rather arbitrarily, um, this is a kind of, I suppose it's an informal um, education program. I'm gonna to have to look at the clock now and not at you guys anymore. Um, so yeah, it's an informal education program. So we uh, are not particularly interested in these lines. These are natural guts. So they're probably from the inside of a cow. People call them cat gut, and, um, but they're not out of the inside of a cat uh, anyway. Um, and they deteriorate over time. Now, what I would say is that any part you take off a clock, send it back to the client. This is particularly important with mainsprings and things like that. But I just put everything, uh, any taper pins, you name it, I stick it in a bag and send it back with the clock and uh, the client does what they want with it. Museums, of course, will keep that stuff uh, in their archive um, because you never know. So just probably easier to show you here. We've got some uh, mini grip bags, which we can label up. And importantly, we've got some uh, photographic scales. If, I mean, I, I don't have a massive um, throughput of objects, but it's not unrealistic that we'll have two or three objects on the go at once and they might be long case clocks and of course one long case clock white looks pretty much like another one sometimes so the first thing the very very first thing is to put a label on it and photograph it and put the date on it and put the inventory number on because you know what happens a day turns into a week which turns into a month we've had that in fact with lockdown we have a clock which was repaired and just about as it was ready to go back lockdown happened we have a quite a relatively elderly client and so we've now had it in store for quite a while which is absolutely no problem but of course you must make sure those parts are labeled um if so i just have some regular um, tie-on labels here. Know that if you're working in a conservation type environment, museum or something, it's always worth asking the conservators what kind of label you want to use. And sometimes they'll say, we don't mind, it, it doesn't matter. Not sticky labels, not making anything on the object, of course. But other times, if it's for longer term storage, you'll want to use archival friendly materials. So you'll want to use acid-free string or cotton archival tape or acid-free paper and stuff like that. So just ask the question. And that's really great because, again, it sort of engages you with the process. Um, so what are we going to call this clock? I should have thought it through before. We'll, we'll call it, um, I'll tell you what we'll call it because we're only doing one clock today. We'll call it the name of the uh, maker or the signature, which is uh, Friar underscore John. And we'll call it today's day, so that's 2021 underscore three underscore four. So what we've got here, is if you can see that or not there we are we've got our um label it's actually quite useful to write that on both sides of the label because it's inevitable that when you come to looking at the label it's turned the wrong way around it's like a usb cable so write it on both sides of the label so that's our object number but that's not the number of any part okay that's just a kind of um, what's the word, Phil <laughs> philosophical object that actually in this case doesn't exist because some of the parts are missing. So we've called it today's date, for sake of argument, but it could be the inventory number. You might want to develop your own number with a client code in there, or a job number code or an invoice code, whatever. As long as you have a system and stick to it, that's all that matters. But what we are going to do here is we're going to give the parts individual uh, name. So I'm going to start another spreadsheet and um, we're going to uh, name the parts. 
So typically what you might do here is to say, okay, so um, A is the uh, trunk of the clock, the clock uh, case. B is the hood. C is the dial. D is a, and so on and so forth. It's kind of arbitrary uh, uh, allocations. It doesn't matter. Then if you get a subset of that part, let's say you're working on the uh, trunk and you want to take off the lock and the lock is broken or something or whatever. Uh, so you would call that A.1, for instance, or A.2. In uh, which way, if you've got an object, and of course I'm duty bound to mention the Bose Swan Automaton with its 700 um, major parts, not including screws and things, that's the only way we kept saying on that project was to have right from the get-go a photo photography labeling system that gave every single component uh, a unique number. And it's been worth its weight in gold. Uh, just um, uh, we're writing a, uh, an article about it at the moment. And recently we could go straight to that object, that uh, wheel or whatever it was, I can't remember now, and find it. So worth its weight in gold. So let's just um, say, for instance, we're going to call this dot A, and that's the case trunk. Again, I won't write this live, otherwise we'll be swapping about, but we'll do the uh, point B is the hood. Put that out the way. Point C is the dial. Point D is the movement. And of course you can break this down as far as you like. You don't really want to make heavy weather of it, but the one way of, uh, and again, if there are museum people out there, uh, then I would love to know uh, what your take is on this. Um, but the, um, you know, what is reasonably going to be disassembled for storage or transportation? There's no point in a clock movement giving all the parts of the movement a, di a different uh, number or identifier if they're not going to be stored or transported like that would be crazy just makes a whole lot of work but here we can already see that we've got these different parts so let's just call d the movement let's call e the seat board maybe that should have been c to go with the case there you go that's the problem with doing it on the uh on the wing, as it were. So we've got E, so we've got F. We've got um, driving weight. Uh, so we're going to call this F1 for the first driving weight and F2 for the second driving weight. We've got pulley, so EFG, G1, and G2. Uh, what else we've got in there? We've got pendulum, G A H G H. So <laughs> H one is going to be the bob, and H two is going to be the rod. Um, We've got pulleys, we've done those. We've got the bob, the rod, the seat bob, the movement. So I think the only thing we've got now is the, um, mm, we've got the hour wheel and the hour wheel pipe, which is broken off. We'll see that in a minute. Um, I could put that as part of the movement, I suppose. Yeah, let's do that just to be extra vigilant, seeing as I were meant to be um, demonstrating kind of good practice. So we've got D1 is the hour wheel and D2 is the hour bridge pipe. I'll do all this a bit neater during the week so we're ready to go next week. But I think we can get the thing out of the box. So our weight lines are consumable. Our taper pins are consumable. Um, who knows? Uh, that's for you lot to um, <laughs> talk about in the live chat. In this case, 
it's reasonable that the wait lines, um, we're not going to be able to get much more information from them, as in if I cut them off is what I'm getting around to. Is that a problem? And I would probably say it isn't a problem here. Again, if you think it is, I, I could spend time on knotting them, but that's all time that my client has to pay for, and I'm not sure that's what they would want me to do per se. So I'm going to cut the lines um, just to speed things up a little bit, and that will help us get the clock out of the box, which is after, which is uh, ultimately what we're after anyway. So I'm going to go and get some cutters, and I'll be back in a second. Got our cutters push around a bit. Now, I, um, I would normally photograph the whole thing together. I photographed it as it is in this box, but it's really quite difficult to get any more photographs without taking it out of the box. And I think the risk of pulling it out with the white lines there, it's a total mess, as you can see, is greater than the cost of cutting the lines. So I'm gonna cut the lines. And as I said, immediately putting things in, um, in a box. Oh, pudding's arrived, yay. And um, Rita, and um, sorry, wrecking the place. And uh, so, what I'm going to do with my bag is I'm immediately going to put on the uh, the number of the object that we talked about right at the beginning, which was the surname. And then the date, 2021, 02, or 03, or 04, in fact. Okay, so we've labeled our bag so things can't get lost. And we'll continue to get those weight lines off. So there we are. Uh, you can see we've liberated the seat board. And so what I'm going to do um, uh, straight away is to associate it with that label um, so it can't get mixed up with anything. And um, you can already see here it's quite dusty, but actually it's pretty sound. It's got some slightly dubious looking um, seat board hooks. So there's our pendulum rod, which has been bent round to fit in the box. So that's good fun. Ah, that's um, this component will be of interest to Wolfie. Um, if Wolfie's watching, Chris, is he watching? Still watching, amazing. What a legend. This is um, almost certainly an experimental piece of lignum vitae from one of John Harrison's 1720 regulators, I think. I'd recognize it anywhere. So, um, so there you go. Don't know what that is, but we'll put it in the bag. Well, 
Right. So the um, interesting thing about this box is it's got the name of the owner on it from where it was uh, before it went to the person that gave it to us. So we're going to keep that label and we're going to somehow incorporate it into the clock case when the clock is finished, because that's an important part of its history or a, a part of its history. Anyway, uh, just a second. Thank you. Right. Um, so let's just have a look here. see so not many um surprises here we'll just move the microphone a bit not many surprises here uh, as i say i noticed before that the um our wheel pipe has broken off the whole thing has got um pushed across Otherwise, it's kind of really in, uh, it's really fine. The crutch is broken, the bell standard's missing, the fly spring has been uh, put around the back of the, uh, the arbor, seconds hand missing. Cool, nice, really, really nice. So I'm gonna continue with the lines. Let's see the clock. Any comments, Rachel, I should know about? Some questions. Ask some questions, okay. We do to have a bit of a break, so questions. Um, we'll just have some. Weight lines be considered considered consumable. Yeah. On the basis that they're very difficult to repair. A wheel. Mm. That cut probably couldn't be repaired once worn or snapped. Yeah, it's it's a good question about the consumable thing. We talked a little bit about the consumable nature of taper pins, which sounds like a, like a hyper nerdy thing to talk about, but I suppose that's what we that's what we're here for. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, a bit of gut line. If you saw a bit of gut line, um, I don't know, from an automaton or something that you felt had some, there's some information there, isn't there? There, there is information in that line. I suppose your one argument might be that that's very common information and not unique, but that's not always the case. One a uh, particular case that jumped to mind is um, a regulator I worked on by uh, Cook uh, before they became Cook, Troughton and Sims. And that regulator had a kind of, maybe it was linen line that was beautifully sort of bound at the end. And I didn't know, but I just wondered whether it was original to the clock. And of course, then you're making that decision, is it still strong enough to hold the weight? because the risk of damage is greater than the benefit of keeping it with the object. And again, we, um, we talked about this the other day, maybe, but um, it's a nice idea that things stay with things. You, know, you give this stuff back to the owner. But the reality is, once you move a thing away from an object or you disassemble a thing for storage, the risk is increased. In my experience, and yeah, we've got stories about bringing things back together again. So we're obviously over the next few weeks going to look at all these repairs in a lot of detail and we'll be listing them uh, and figuring out what to do, given that we sort of decided we would bring this clock back to working order, given that it was once in working order. Um, so you can see what we've got. We'll just run through it very quickly uh, because what I'm going to do now, and this is going to be like terminally boring. So um, in fact, the, the 
last thing we're going to do today is to do some photography. It needs to be done. So I'm going to do the whole of the project live. And uh, you're very welcome to hang around. Um, but anyway, so we've got our, uh, can you see that? Our wheel. Uh, nothing amiss there. It's got a 24 hour wheel. So it's got a wheel that drove some kind of date mechanism and it's got a pin here, which is interesting because the clock dial doesn't have another date. Uh, so it doesn't have any moon work or anything that needed a 24 hour impulse as well. So is this dial associated with the movement? I don't think it is, but let's have a look at it as we go on. Um, so this is really uh, just a bit of uh, washing, cleaning. Uh, that's absolutely fine. No, nothing there. I can't. We, we'll look more later, but it hasn't got any broken teeth or anything. So job done. Um, the pendulum bob, uh, cast iron, uh, again, absolutely fine. A bit grubby, but um, one thing I would look uh here for straight away is can the rating nut be regulated by the so I'll put it back in the shot can the rating nut be regulated by the client because there's no point taking a clock back and saying oh you might have to tweak the regulation if it can't actually be done often down here the nut will kind of get stuck in the bottom of the bob and you might have to add reversibly a spacing piece just to make it easier to regulate now in this case the um the rating nut is pretty mm, don't know think about that uh for sure a, a spacing piece there would help massively just to help the client rate it and you can make that out of some material make it out a bit of uh, delrin or something so it's obvious that it's later you could stamp the date on it so it can be undone at any uh, later date but of course what we've got here is the um we'll have a closer look later but the rating thread uh, not the rating thread sorry the rod where it goes into the bottom block is snapped off so um what are we going to do there so as i'm doing my photography that's great because it buys me time um it's a kind of internalization process again i would advise people as i said the other week about looking out at bits of brass spend an hour looking at the bit of brass and then you can identify it. And it's the same thing here. Doing photography is, of course, it's dead simple nowadays with digital, but it's a really good way of internalizing an object. You really get to see it rather than jumping straight in and missing things. So that needs some attention. We've got um, a couple of bits of veneer from the case, which I will put uh, in a bag in a minute um and i think that's it oh we've got weight pulleys so we've got uh what appears to be a pair of matching weight pulleys so other than the hands i think um we need a winding crank as well other than the hands i think we're good to go I haven't actually seen the dial fitted onto the movement yet, and it might be that they've got nothing to do with one another, in which case uh, we'll have a movement without a dial. Um, I'll show you the dial. I mean, I'll show you it now um, very quickly. It's early 19th century dial. One point of interest is a dial foot missing and the date wheel and its uh, stud have gotten bent over, if you can see that or not. So that will need straightening too. Um, but uh, other than a bit of rust on the back, the dial is in good nick, I like it. And you can just see the signature there, maybe. Sometimes you have to look under a black light to be able to identify that. And then we've got this typical kind of empire scene. So we've got, um, anybody know who this is? Um, and then we've got the four corners of the empire there. So cool, really happy with that. 
Um, we might do some uh, surface cleaning on that dial. We might get it to a paintings conservator. Um, uh, who knows? It's all to play for. I won't be uh, doing any kind of maybe some uh, touching in of losses, maybe, but I certainly won't be doing any overpainting or repainting of the thing. I'm um, not where not where I'm at, as they say. Okay, so the dull bit now. This is probably going to take about half an hour. So um, you are very welcome to hang around. Uh, it's lovely to have your company but I totally understand if you want to sign off and go and watch the TV or do anything else. So we're going to use these um, uh, photographic scales. So it's just 10 centimetres. And I did these on uh, Autodesk, I think it was, years and years and years ago. And I see them cropping up all over the place. You could just use a ruler. The good thing about this is, I don't know if you can see there, but I put a little space for the date and a little space for the reference. So I'm going to write one of these out and photograph all this stuff uh, with the little photographic scale in place. Then again, when you're sorting out three years goes by and you're looking for that thing, or you say, you know, did I do this? Did I do that? Whatever. It's all there and it's linked back to that number, which might be linked back to an inventory number or something. So um, make some of these are really, really uh, useful. So I've got some scissors somewhere. So um, you got time for questions? Yeah, yeah, pass, yeah. Um, Was the bell not connected to the case? Ah. Jane noticed. Good point. Jane, the bell is on the case. I totally forgot about that. It's not on the um, on the bell standard which again uh, is interesting how that's fitted on there. Yeah, so Jane, 10 points there for ob um, being observant. Brilliant, thank you for <laughs> reminding me of that. We won't look at the case today. Uh, I need to do a bit of um, reworking of things uh, in our studio before that can happen, but it's uh, sort of typical early 19th century mahogany veneered, good solid pub clock with the bell mounted on the backboard, which is presumably what happened once the bell standard had snapped off. So, any more questions? Um, Jane's just saying that she's cleaned up taper pins from 30-hour movement, and they don't look original to her. No. I mean, I think the thing with taper pins, if they're not draw filed, uh, I, the kind of thing I've seen where I think they've been original, of course, we'll never know, is in French clocks, so relatively modern late 19th century clocks. Uh, and in the Enfield, of course, we see pins in there that uh, are probably maybe uh, original, who knows. Um, so I'm not particularly fussed about table pins. I would say that's one area where you want the thing to be safe and functional, but you can definitely clean them and straighten them. They're usually soft iron, so that's uh, easy to do. Any other questions? Keep the questions coming, by the way. I can just about photograph and do questions at the same time, just about. I'll try to do this so you can see what I'm doing. Oh, we could um, actually ask about sound. Should we ask about sound for the Open Clock Club people? Yeah. The question is for Open Clock Club people or anybody who's seen one of these things before, we've um, borrowed a better quality microphone today. So the question is, is the sound worse, the same or better? Thank you. Then we will splash out on a new microphone if it's better. Uh, cast iron. Oh, is Sam watching? Yeah. Well, he's a conservator, or he's um, he's he's got connections in that world. So he's answering our conservation questions. It's cast iron. Um, 
know whether I showed people the other day, but better not get distracted with another clock. But I've got a, a similar period clock um, to repair at the moment. And the, the bell nut was cast iron. It's the first time I've ever seen it. And it had a number cast into it. So that was like really nice. Um, so yeah, the pendulum bob is cast iron. Nice. And it's There we are. So we've done our little label. Now, in this case, um, if it was a bigger project, I would put individual um, numbers or that, that numbering system that we just developed then. And that, by the way, is just something um, that's kind of typical. There are all sorts of different ways of doing it. Um, I would put each part on there, but it's obvious here. We haven't got 120 components that all look the same. The pendulum bob is pretty obvious what it is. So I'm going to spend, as I said, the next 20 minutes or so um, with my photographic scale uh, photographing this clock. So there you go. Thank you, by the way, for um, joining in today. Hope it wasn't too difficult finding us. So I'm going to, um, just for the movement, these, re remember, are only kind of um, record shots for condition as received. Um, I'm not particularly interested in any detail at the moment. So I'm just going to photograph the movement uh, full on and then rotate by 45 degrees uh, each, each time. And that'll be enough. The pendulum bob, I'll probably photograph the front and the back and so on. So we can say... This is our clock as received if there's ever any question in future. And again, this will go with our report or treatment proposal so people can look at it and say, oh, yeah, I see what you mean. That is interesting. Right. Um, and of course, there's a question, what we're going to do with the clock when it's done? If it ever gets done. So... Um, when you're taking these uh, photographs, I don't have particularly flashy uh, camera gear. We are slowly building up to a camera with a macro lens so we can really get some better detail shots. But at the moment I'm using Old Faithful, which is a Canon G16. I've had it for years and years and years, and it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, it's not a particular photographer's camera, but I always use a um, uh, tripod. I've got my Manfrotto tripod here, which I've had for 25 years or something now. And um, I use Aperture Priority because I've found on this gray paper, a bit of a story about the gray paper, apologies for going down the old Nerdsville route. But um, I once uh, worked on a clock for uh, an institution and those pictures were published in a journal and I photographed the, the clock on some, I don't know why I did it, but on some crazy kind of green background. And the uh, photo uh, editor went bonkers because he really struggled to get this green off everything. So ever since then, I've used Photorama Storm Grey, which I find is a nice 
kind of plain gray. I've used the same uh, material now again for about 20 years. So all my pictures have broadly got the same color on. And the good thing with that is if you are into photography a little bit, I use aperture priority. You can just overexpose a bit when you want a pingy kind of shot and just use yourself time. But anyway, it's not a photography course. Thank you. interesting fascination for cast iron uh yeah it's got um it's a bit it's just dirty and rusty i don't think it's painted but we'll have a we'll have a close look at it uh later on it's quite nicely cast but it, it is cast iron honest about um sorry it's not a photography uh course but about a year ago um i bought some quite inexpensive led lights these ones you can see here and they're a bit tacky uh, but they come in a hold all if you work in institutions uh, like historic houses it's like always really gloomy You've got to be a bit careful about light levels, of course, particularly around textiles and things like that. So you have to talk to conservators. Um, but these LED lights in a hold all thing, um, yeah, it's a bit cheap and nasty, but they've been absolutely brilliant. Um, you can change the color temperature, uh, you can change the brightness. They've even got a remote control somewhere. So I've got three of them and they've been already worth their, uh, worth their weight in gold. Are there any special precautions you need to take when you're working with lead? Yeah. Apart from not licking it. <laughs> she knows then about the clock case. No, I was going to tell her, but then I thought maybe that's another share. It might be. Yeah, good point from uh, Jane there. Lead and mercury. If you see mercury, mercury pendulum bob barometers, which are like the devil's work, then a big alarm bell goes off in your in your mind. Mold. Um, there are many other things, and, I, and that's kind of getting into mainstream conservation, which I'm not. But mould, lead, um, you often see lead that's been in wooden cases, gets a white powder on it, which is often from that lead acetate, so acetic acid from oak. You do not want to breathe that stuff in. You don't want to get it on your hands, so use uh, a, um, a suitably graded respirator when working with moulds and lead. Uh, handling and mercury basically the the rule is with mercury for me anyway get the mercury out of the thing and into a strong sealed container that's labeled and properly uh, stored and always advise the owner to have a mercury spill kit at hand in case there's a, an accident Actually, this clock, although it's a bit, little bit rusty, is looking amazing. It's really, I'm really pleased with it. Seems a shame to wash the spider's webs off. And again, the, um, the good thing about this paper, it comes in various widths. The, the widest one that's kind of like regularly available is 2.72 meters. So you can sew it up with a handsaw or a bandsaw and get multiple shorter, uh, shorter widths. Um, ours is just about coming to an end. But of course, a clock like this is going to make it dirty. 
you can just chuck the paper away. It's really useful. So I'm not going to labor the photography of this too much because we'll be taking many, many more pictures as we, um, as we progress. That's just done the movement. Yes, really nice. And in fact, I think that the movement's gonna be very straightforward. Um, I, yeah, really don't see much at all wrong with it. Anyway, don't get distracted. I'll just, um, if you can hear while I'm kind of doing this photography, I'll just talk a bit about what the process is going to be for the next few weeks. And that is um, not always, but with an object like this, I much prefer to do everything around the movement first, which is kind of bad news for you, maybe, because we probably won't dive into the, into the movement straight away. But um, pain um, in teaching told me that when the movement is done, you're like about halfway to getting the clock done. And again, uh, soapbox moment. Um, if you get the movement done first, for me, it's always a drag then to do the pendulum, the weights, the case, the dial, the hands, all those things, because they can take forever. And you kind of kid yourself into thinking the clock's done. So what I've had many times is a clock, the clock's finished. No, it's not finished. We've got a client coming tomorrow. We need to get the thing finished. So I, for my own kind of sanity, like to do the pendulum, the weights, the hands, the dial, do everything else. We probably won't do the case in this case because I don't really have space to work on it here. Um, we'll look at the case, but we'll do the move and the how we're done. So we'll get all that stuff done. So the second the movement is finished, we can just put it in the case and it's done and we don't have that for what, for me, is a bit of a sinking feeling of like, oh, I've got to start doing this and that and the other now. So that's kind of going to be a warning, really. That's going to be the order. So probably next week we will uh, start, I'll start on the seat board, uh, just basically vacuuming and a bit of surface cleaning, do some dimensions, that kind of thing. Then I'll move on to the pendulum rod, uh, pulleys, weights, and then when they're done, I can pack them away, put them in storage, and then forget about them until I'm ready to use them. And um, I, I won't get on to clock test stands today, but um, maybe at one point when I'm uh, talking about testing clocks. Just um, thinking about the report writing here, for most work, what I offer with a repair is obviously a list of things I've done, uh, a short proposal and report and a longer and a, and a short treatment report as well at the end of it. Um, but I do offer to clients, some want it to pay for it, some don't. I don't want to spend ages doing a much more in-depth report when people don't want it. I don't want to pay for it because most work is kind of routine and repeated. But let's say, for instance, we work on an object that is more unique than this one is. Everything's unique, but um, what some people might call more significant or important, whatever, I don't mind. Uh, but maybe you're taking it apart and you're seeing the thing for the first time in decades and it's unlikely to be taken apart again. So you want to capture much more information. So there is an option there of extending that report. But of course, that takes more time and therefore it's more expensive.
As you can see, I'm really rattling through these. These are these are record shots. Um, I I'm looking as I go through it for interesting things. Like here, you can see that the seat board has uh, been nailed down. Here, there's still one nail in there. So I'm thinking, hmm, what do I do with that? Do I leave it or take it out? Seat board hooks, which um, you know, are almost certainly later. I don't think clocks came with seat board hooks from new. Um, you know, this thing here with the Meccano on it, what do we do with that? Do we keep it? Do we leave it? Uh, and so on. So I'm kind of thinking it through. But otherwise, um, I'm just at the moment snapping away and we'll come back to those uh, as we repair them or deal with them, should I say, and add more detail as we go along. I was going to say, um, I, I don't know where I, I saw it. It might have been in antiquarian horology, but some journal or something. I saw an article recently about a uh, candle wax on seat boards and was it put there on purpose I think was the kind of hypothesis to make the thing look older and um, I've just seen I just thought has this got any and yes it has or it appears to have uh, a little bit um, heal up which is quite nice so um, I presume that was when somebody was looking in the side of the clock movement with a candle and um, it dripped down, I presume. And then last but not least. You will have um, seen that weight wanting to roll around there. If you want to make um, a little wedge or temporary mount for something like this, again, in this field, it's always useful to have um, bits of um, closed cell foam. It's called Plastazote. It's retailed under that uh, brand name. And again, it's one of those conservation materials that's incredibly useful to at least know the name of it, know that it exists, because it's part of that concept, that part of the conversation that you're likely to have with other sort of um, heritage professionals, plasterzote somewhere. Not quite know where. So, for questions? Yeah, questions, questions, questions. From Ian. Yeah. Um, is there any false plate makers information and would you record this? 
Um, so we'll be separated. We'll def definitely would record it because if you're interested in, um, yeah, the false plate information, I'll, I'll have a look. I don't think there is, um, but uh, yeah, you definitely record that because, course, if you are interested in the history of the object or whoever is, owner, whatever, then if you've got it apart, record that, absolutely. The other clock that we're working on at the moment does have a cast iron false plate with um with uh, a maker's uh, name cast in there or a foundry name but i think this is uh machine i'll just finish photographing these weights and then we're done Right, I think that's it, isn't it? I've got the um, I've got the dial to do, and um, I might as well do the dial now. What the heck? Well, let's just have a look at that false plate. Yes, it does, Ian. Maybe you can see it there or not. Maybe it's out of focus. See that? Let's just have a look under some uh, magnification. Mm, I can't read it. Um, I know we're um, not meant to be jumping about, but it's great fun. Thank you for the question. So what we'll do next week is we'll get that false plate off and identify it. I'm not that familiar with the names. I know there are people like Whitaker and Shreve and people like that. But we've got the white dial, but Rachel's got the white dial book anyway. So we can have a look and uh, we'll... Uh, if we can, oh, it's on the wrong side. We can say we'll scan it on a flatbed scanner, but um, we can't really do that. So we'll get uh, an idea of what the, uh, the false plate name is. James says what's a false plate. Right, okay. So um, in, again, probably totally the wrong person to answer this, uh, Jane. But a false plate is um, basically a late 18th, early 19th century type device. When clocks increasingly became made by manufacturers, it's, um, if you imagine the front plate of the clock, in fact, I can show you it here. Here we have our front plate of the clock, and then we've got our dial plate here. The false plate is this device here, and it goes between the two. And it was basically, in, it made fitting an X dial to a Y movement without them being together right from the beginning of their manufacturing life. So it was a way of improving the efficiency of manufacturing in the sense of the dials could be made in one place, the movements in another, um, and then they were brought together. And this false plate was the kind of device that allowed them to come together more easily. But as I say, I'm afraid I'm really totally the worst person to uh, answer that question. But I think there are probably people either, either watching and certainly on Facebook and certainly on those sites that are about clock history, which we're not really, who would be able to answer um, much better.
design flow. Sorry about that. We um a wonky picture. Uh, need a better way of holding our camera. Anyway, let's just take some pictures. I don't know whether this uh, dial would fit on um, a scanner, a big a big scanner, but certainly again in institutions they often have uh, those scanners that are non, you know, they go above the object for scanning historic books. So it'd be really cool to put something like this dial through to get um, more information. And as I said, with the right uh, protective glasses on, look under a black light to see if there's any other information there, particularly to do with that signature. I know um, sometimes the date wheels as well have um, that uh, a cast, a cast uh, foundry mark as well. This one doesn't appear to have. Down here again, so you can look at this lovely movement, which is already squidged down on the back. So, mm. right. Well. That's maybe a good place to leave it, um, if there's anybody there watching still. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, something a bit different, and it set the pace and the kind of tone for how we're going to uh, progress with this object. As I said, next week, um, we're going to start working on the weights and the pendulum and those kind of things that surround the, the movement. So when our object, when the movement's finished, we can just put it together and we are good to go. So we'll get into a bit of washing next week, cleaning essentially, uh, because we can clean those weights we can clean that pendulum bob. Uh, it won't make amazing viewing, I'm afraid. Uh, you'll have to wait for getting the movement plates apart. But in the meantime, we can be thinking about the process. So hopefully the first part of this evening's session was useful, that idea about the approach, that idea about developing practice and what this means to you, what objects mean, and really importantly, how your interaction with objects obviously changes them physically and what you think about them as well. Thinking actually changes objects really as much as cleaning or pushing or whatever that is. So I hope you enjoyed it. A million thanks for joining us. Super special thanks as always to Open Clock Club live chat team. who have been doing a brilliant job there. Thank you. And we will see you next Thursday, all being well at the same time. And uh, we'll get some pictures up on Instagram and all that kind of stuff eventually as well. So thanks very much and bye for now.